of what we did last term. But what I want to really home in on is the fact that we need to really think about creating our presentation because starting in a couple of weeks' time, you are going to be doing most of the work here in this session. Uh, there's going to be th three groups or thereabouts each week um, presenting a little presentation about some research you've done about how SAS works and what it does. And so I want to cover, again, ideas about uh, how to create a really good presentation. And then I'll show you the topics and talk a little bit about that, because that's going to be based on what you're doing already in the 20 chapters, and then going forward to uh, other more interesting research as well. This is all about using PowerPoint to give presentations. And what is really, it's all going to be about over the next four or five weeks, there'll be five weeks worth of presentations leading up to Easter. And it's something cool that you guys can do. You'll be working in pairs and finding something interesting about SAS. Then you're going to tell us what's really great. And basically, it's going to be a nice, simple structure. Three obvious first pages, the title page, which will include you know, the names of the, the couple who are actually, or pair who are actually doing the work and presenting, what your aim is, what your objectives are, and then two or three slides covering the main points. And then a little bit at the end, well, a conclusion that rounds it all off, and maybe one extra slide afterwards, so an exercise that you, would, you think would be really great for your colleagues here to do, to get a little bit of practice about the various areas of SAS. But do you remember we talked about these, what I want to say and what I need to say last term? Do you remember that? Some of you do. Really, the point here is that if we've done some good research about something we're really interested in, we have a big problem. There's so much to say. And yet, you've got a short time. So you then need to think back, okay, of all that I want to say, which is really interesting to me at least, or to us at least, what's going to be really important about the topic area? Whether it's about getting data into SAS, cleaning it up, clever ways of presenting it or reporting it, You've done quite a lot of work. You'll have done a week or two or three years worth of work researching it, finding something really fun to do with it, finding some interesting data that you can actually apply to this to demonstrate what you're doing. And so you've got to think about what do I need to say? Out of all that I want to say, how do I compress it to the most important stuff? But then you need to think, okay, so that's the what. What's the content? And then you have to think, okay, Another filter that helps you reduce it to something that's manageable is to think about why. Why are you trying to say that? Why do you want to tell someone all about it? Why do you need to? Because that links back to another filter that slows it down. And then the question about who. Who's the audience? Well, that's going to be very simple. It's you guys. It's not me or Mosin. It's going to be you helping each other to learn about the really interesting things about SAS. SAS is such a huge area. You can do so many really interesting and fun things with it. And then you think about timing. So, one of the things you've got to think about then is, are you going to be doing this presentation persuade us about something, or to persuade your colleagues here about something, or are you just trying to show them something really magical? There are so many magical things about SAS. And that means you then bring in the filtering out the want to the need. And the thing about this need one is, how much actually, of all that I want to say that's really great, how much is actually important? Because we're all so good when we're talking about bringing all sorts of lovely little stories or anecdotes that add to it. 
in our minds. But it may not connect with our audience. So you've got to think it very through very carefully. And think about the focus. So as when I show you the five topic areas, first of all, we're going to have to sort of decide who's going to do which topics. And then you have to think about the over. We're trying to get over. We'll come back to this as we look at the topic areas. We'll, so that What's your aim going to be? Why? Then you have to think about, you've all done the 20 chapters, or will have all done the 20 chapters in another couple of weeks, I guess. Because you're making so much progress so quickly, it's great. <clears throat> so the question is, you're really talking to people who already understand quite a lot about how base SAS works, but some of the topics are a little bit more than base SAS. Some really cool things. And you're going to have to look at some of those manuals that are on that, those 120 um, manuals that are available. So, what do we already know? Do you need to give a little bit of a sort of summary of that area of SAS you're using? Or do you just assume they'll catch up? That they've probably covered it already as part of the 20 chapters? And then you have to think about, and you may need to think carefully about with some of the topics, there may be some important terms that you're going to be talking about in your presentation which actually needs defining because you've gone into one of the manuals which other people possibly won't have actually looked at. So you might need to think about having a slide there which is defining important topics or important terms. And one simple metric is you've got eight, six to eight slides, so that's going to give you possibly somewhere between two and five minutes a slide. And if we say each presentation is going to be about 10, 15 minutes, that's going to give you a kind of a feel about how much content you've got and how much you're going to talk about a slide. And remember <coughs> that it's really, really important not A, to read everything on the slide, and B, not to have very much. In, if you give good presentations, each slide introduces or covers a particular topic or particular area. And you need to have one or two or three or four bullet points there with the natural font sizes. Don't change the font sizes to smaller unless you absolutely have to. You should have about four or five bullet points per slide, and they act as a little framework to tell your audience what it is you're talking about. Not what you're going to read, because, hey, you guys can read, we can all read what's up there. And the point is, it's just a little framework to make it easier for the audience to connect with and then remember the things that you're talking about. So, very, very short in terms of the slide, even if you're going to talk for five minutes about the content there. The other thing to remember in terms of timing is at the end of your little presentation, you'll want to leave about three to five minutes for questions from the audience. Because that's going to be part of the criteria that we're assessing you on. Never reduce it below that sort of font size. If it is, you're writing too much. Because that's, if you write six, seven, eight lines of ten point font, the audience is going to spend all their time reading it and not listening to you. So you might just as well sit here and press the down button about every five minutes, every two or three minutes and let the audience read it, at which point why are you standing in front of them? The whole thing is to connect with your audience. You don't spend all your time turning around, reading slides or signposts to your talk, keep the slides simple. You can read that. Added to which, my back is toward you. 
and we don't speak out of the back of our head, so it's quite a bit quiet back there somewhere, unless you raise your voice. And if you are giving a presentation for the first time, you're probably a little bit nervous, and you probably talk quite quietly. And that can't be heard at the back of the room, it probably can't even be heard at the front of the room. <laughs> Presentations are all about telling a story. The idea is that you should allow the audience about five, ten seconds to read what's on the slide to pick up that structure. How many of you remember or have ever seen an office which has a coat stand standing in the corner where you hang up your jackets at the... Anybody seen one of those? Few of you have. The other, what I like to think about a slide is, is a bit like a coat stand. It provides the hooks that capture things. And they provide the structure. You see, the way the human brain tends to work is if it's already got a structure in there about the topic, we can pick up the ideas and remember them quite easily because they connect to the structure. And these are a little bit like the ideas that you need to remember. Now, if, for example, you're at a party and there's a coat stand there, and at the moment there's a heap of... everybody just come in and taken their jackets off or coats and so on, dumped them on a heap on the floor. You've put, and think of the game where you get somebody standing by the coat stand, somebody standing by the heap of clothes, and there's hats and there's coats. And you want to end up with the hats at the top and the coats at the bottom under normal circumstances. If the person picking them up just keeps throwing one at a time at the person by, by the coat stand, and they haven't worked out that hats go at the top and the coats go at the bottom, it's going to be a shambles. Yeah, you'll start putting the coats at the top or the bottom or the hats, the first thing that come, yeah, and it gets a mess. And if we don't use our slides a bit like that to provide the structure, our brains get kind of messed up, and our memory isn't very efficient. But if you do the right job of structuring like this logical progression from one slide to the next, and a logical progression of ideas in the slide that you can read to the audience in the first 10 seconds, maybe I even just stand quietly for 10 seconds while the audience reads it, and then get on with it. And then you've got it in your head what's coming, and then you can pick it all up quite quickly. One of the things that I learned when PowerPoint was first invented back in the mid 80s, early or thereabouts, on a presentation course was never ever use special effects. PowerPoint has an amazing number of things that you can make all the bullet points fly in from the left and the right and up and down. You go from one slide to the next with a whiz in and a whiz out. And that. All that does is to show the audience that you know how to use PowerPoint. And if you do it really well, they get seasick. But that's not what you're trying to prove. You're trying to capture your audience about what you're talking about, not how clever you are at all the whizzy whizzy stuff. Never ever use flying bullet points. It irritates me when someone has a, a blank uh, slide with a title, and then they go over and hit press, and the first bullet point zooms in like that. <laughs> and then the next comes zooming in that way. No, don't do that. It really irritates the audience. Because they want to actually see that. And then they can concentrate on you, on what you're saying, for the next two, three minutes, or however long you're talking. <coughs> so, one of the things you ought to do, because this is going to be for real, go and find advice on creating presentations. Google and YouTube have some magical resources to show you how not to do it, and how to do it. Because there are some fabulous examples out there of marketing people who love the whizzy whizzy, who pour data in, 
I'm sure you've seen presentations where every slide has 10 or 12 bullet points, the text is so fine, you need a telescope or binoculars to read it all, or a microscope if it's close up. I think that's still there, I haven't checked that, but there, if that is still there, um, it's really very, very interesting about the things that you shouldn't do. There are at least seven things that cause upset, cause confusion, disconnect you. And yeah, it's always worth getting more than one set of ideas. One of the things we try to teach you uh, over the next two, three years, as we, as in terms of research, is always try and find at least two or more different views. Multiple perspectives, we call it. Because as, we, as you develop your ability to do critical thinking, which is all about what this universe is about, is learning how to be a critical thinker, you can't do that with just one source of information. Because critical thinking, among other things, is comparing and contrasting ideas. So, everybody has a different view about how to give a good PowerPoint-based or any sort of uh, presentation. They don't have to do PowerPoint, um, but it makes life easier if you do for, for here. Because although people talk about death by PowerPoint, what they're really complaining about are people who have 30 or 40 or 50 slides from an hour's lecture or seminar, very dense with lots and lots and lots and lots of bullet points and very small text. And then the cardinal sin, turning around and just reading the whole darn thing or else looking at this. Kind of looking at you guys, but actually looking here. A bit like, you know, if you go to your GP these days, they spend most of their time looking at the screen, don't they? At all the test results and everything. And occasionally, they get like that, and then occasionally they look over at you, they might go and feel your pulse or something. That doesn't connect with me as a patient, or you connecting with me giving the presentation as the audience. So, lots of different ideas, and what you need to think about is what is going to work for me, or for you, or you, or you, or you, or you? Because you're all different, you have different ways of speaking, you have different ways of thinking, you connect ideas in different ways. And so you've got to think about what works best for you, and what works, is going to work really well for your audience. So have a look at that one. Thinking about the structure, how to present it, Think of a nice, snappy title that grabs people's attention. Makes the, maybe you have a slightly formal main title, but a more snappy subtitle. That also works quite nicely. And as you plan it out, go through there, maybe you think, okay, I've got three or four important points that I want to cover. I'll give a, a slide for each of those. Put the title up there. And then as you develop your research a bit more, you'll be able to fill in a few more points on each of the slides. And you might want some images or pictures, screenshots, whatever tells, helps you to tell the story. And then provide that summary at the back end. You know, you'll have been talking for 10, 12 minutes, maybe a bit more if you really got into the subject. Humans need to have a reminder that's why we put conclusions at the end of uh, essays, end of reports, end of dissertations, end of articles. To remind the reader what those important points were that they may have lost or may not have picked up completely. Background. There are an amazing range of uh, templates in PowerPoint which have all sorts of different types of background. White, colours around the edges, pictures across the, right across there for example. All sorts of different ways of doing things. Now the reason that I use this, gold on blue, is that 
When I was at Rolls Royce, gosh, this was back in the mid 80s, one of the, the librarians there, who was really great on in helping me and doing things, he said, one of the problems is every template just about <coughs> uses black text on white background. The white background glares very, very vigorously. The enormous contrast, and that tires people's eyes very, very quickly. The other thing that he pointed out is gave me so some research that had been done around about the mid late eighties about readability, and that it said, and what it said was that people could read and comprehend. A serif font like this, Garamond times New Roman, and much, much more effectively and much faster than an absolutely lousy font that was around then, which was called Helvetica, which is now Arial, a sorcery font. And 95-ish percent of people can work with serif fonts much more rapidly than with sorcery like Arial. Which is why I always insist, for example, that assignments I get are written in Times New Roman or Garamond, something like that. Because I can read that and understand what you are saying much quicker than if you write, write it in Arial. There are a very small number of people, various particular issues, who find serif fonts difficult. But the question you have to think about and ask yourself is, <clears throat> Do you want to slow everybody down, the 95% who can use the serif font fonts more effectively, just for the 5% who find it difficult? Current political correctness tends to say, okay, well, now there are a small number of people who can't read serif fonts properly, so you give them Arial, black on white, and you kind of slow everybody else up. That's an interesting question. Which way do you balance? Now, I have had some one or two people in the module um, feedback from last semester in ICS say, gold on blue is beautifully uh, soporific. <laughs> okay, well, most of you didn't comment on that as uh, adversely. <clears throat> Don't think it was the PU people, I'm not sure. But I can't tell from the feedback forms who's who and so on, so they're fully not. If you don't like this, let me know, email me or something, and then I'll provide a second copy which is a, a different format for you. But in terms of your presentations, think about experimenting with the background, uh, the cut, uh, font colours and so on. One of the things that came out, was it last year? I think it was in this module. Someone came up with a magical, beautiful dragon swirling across the backdrop, the back of the slide. And when we saw it, we thought, wow, that's beautiful. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't read the text at all. Beautiful nonsense. Pardon? That beautiful nonsense, isn't it? Yeah, it was very, very beautiful, but just completely failed the test of effectiveness. <laughs> so experiment, because I guess many, how many of you have actually ever created a presentation before? How many of you have experimented with the different backgrounds and, and start templates and so on? So a few of you have. Well, take the opportunity to do that, to really begin to understand how it messes. A, care, a good choice of font and colour and background can work very, very well and add powerfully to the, the story. And how often it's just, oh, aren't I clever? I found a beautiful background and isn't it fantastically beautiful? I'm sorry you can't read it. You could try out special effects, fly in, fly out, and, and so on. It's probably not worth the effort. You guys have done presentations before, have you found that? That it's not really worth the effort? I mean, I, I, when I was in a business school and teaching in Malawi and Botswana, Zimbabwe. The, I acquired various presentations for modules from lecture notes and so on, or lecture slides, from various colleagues. And several of them had carefully engineered every single slide 
to have all six bullet points fly in from left and right and upside down and so on for every single of their 50 slides per lecture. This was an interesting exercise to deactivate all of the special effects. It took an awful lot of effort. And it didn't, they hadn't added anything else apart from hiding from you the next thing. They, you know, they had that there. And then suddenly that flew in. You know, they leave you in the dark wondering what's going on. Two little thoughts. One of the things that first time or early presenters have a problem with is timing. A bit of nervousness. And when we're nervous, we start talking faster and faster and faster. And if we're really excited and nervous, we can get up to about 200, 210 words a minute, which is kind of a tad fast. Just slow down. But don't slow down too much, otherwise we'll wonder what's happening and we'll start going to sleep because we're waiting for something. But take your time and try and keep, sort of, you know, get over those nerves. One of the things that's always kind of useful to do, particularly if it's an audience you've never seen before, so you've gone to a conference or something, is to set the ground rules about questions. Do you want to be interrupted in the middle, at the point when the feedback, or the answer, will have the most impact, or do you want to keep people waiting until the end, in that hope that they'll have forgotten the question and they won't embarrass you with a question you can't answer? So it's a bit about, think about that, make it clear at the beginning whether you can, will accept interruptions or not. Mention that one, kind of goes back to there, Don't rush. And talk to the audience. Keep eye contact. Because what you'll learn from that is whether you're boring people or whether you're really engaging with them, whether they're connecting with you. Because you can see people smiling at you and agreeing, you can see people nodding heads. And what you'll discover is you will actually start talking to the five or six people in the audience who are actually smiling at you and nodding vigorously or even shaking their heads. There you are. <laughs> and it then brings you to life, which then brings the whole thing to life. Just a few thoughts about how you can make your presentation really interesting. A little bit of planning, a little bit of care, let the audience read the slides before you actually start talking yourself. They'll get the hang of that quickly. And then at the end, summarise. So that's all about giving a presentation of questions. And for future ref, you can always ask me questions whenever you like. You don't have to wait till the end of the session. You can ask them whenever you like. And there's actually quite an interesting point about that. It's a bit like learning SAS or learning any programming or learning any skill. The best time to get the feedback, the answer or further questions, is when you have the problem. Because that will solve your problem there and then. And you'll remember it. If we said, OK, you're working on SAS and you can ask us, we'll, have, we'll set aside 10 minutes at the end of the two hours after you've been doing or struggling with the 20 chapters, whichever, for the last hour and three quarters, and then we can give you some help at the end of that, that's not going to be very useful for you, is it? If you're stuck, you can't do the lib name or the file name, the lib ref or whatever, um, at the time, if you don't get the answer then, you've wasted the next hour. And you won't learn the answer then. So, questions whenever you like, folks. <coughs> now, let's have a little look 
Oh, sorry, did you want to ask any questions about that? Was it all clear? We forgot halfway. You've forgotten. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> different colour coding. Not had time over the last year or so to actually turn them into my own style. So this comes from um, the SAS Student Academy uh, colour code. You are going today to spend a little time working out and letting me know who you're going to work with in your, hopefully in the end, 15 uh, little groups, sort of, of two each. And that will set the scene for a lot of what you're going to be doing for the next, well, for the rest of the term. You can negotiate a different topic, perhaps, but you've got to agree with me. Three or four um, presentations each week. We'll actually end up with two per group, so actually that's going to be six a week. Um, in, in total, because of the, the numbers in the group. So there are, what, 30 of you, I think, so we've got 15 groups, and if we do two presentations a week, in other two different topics, that's going to end up a little bit more than that. What we'll also do during the presentations, I'll, I'll be giving you out, handing out various um, sheets on which you can make your notes about the pres each presentation, and provide feedback. Uh, particularly, not so much that's rubbish and you shouldn't have done it like that, but kind of what went well and how to improve. So I want to be positive. <coughs> and we'll be starting the first presentations in two weeks' time, roughly. Hmm? Oh, yeah. So these are four, five topics. How to get data into SAS, a topic called ETL or data cleansing will be on the 23rd. The ODS system is the thing that drives the modern SAS graphics and provides all sorts of interesting ways of tailoring the system and controlling it. So two sets of presentations on the graphic systems and then 15th of March, just before Easter, more sort of reports, of tabular reports and all the other ways of getting printed out um, results. Some of the sort of things you're doing already with prop means and freak and the other sort of things that you're picking up as you go through the 20 chapters. So the first stage, whichever top of those five topics you choose, and you're each going to choose two of those topics. The first thing is to think about which manual out of those 120 manuals is going to be useful to you. And that's going to be a little bit of a <coughs> negotiation between each pair. And then, having thought about it a bit, you'll start thinking about, well, what aspect? So you'll have to have a quick scan through the manual that we've chosen, whether it's one of the graphics manual, the ODS manual, templates, or data cleansing, so on. So there'll be various areas of, of, of SAS you'd want to think about, maybe base SAS, the data step, and so on, if you're doing that. So you need to understand the basis of the topic. You'll need to find some data that's useful to help you illustrate the topic that you're choosing. Now there are huge amounts of data out there in the big wide world. Um, I'll show you an area that you're going to help me uh, develop over your next three years where there are pointers to some of the source of data that's already there and I want you to help me by showing me other interesting sources of data that are useful for learning SAS and analytics with. You'll then move on to the next stage. Within your chosen area, you'll develop some suitable SAS code. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. It's not that you're going to write that much code. 
It could be about five, six, seven, eight lines. Maybe it's a bit as little as that. That will demonstrate what it is you're trying to show us. It's cool. Now remember that SAS is so powerful, a lot of the time, you hardly need to give any, or write very much code to do some really amazing things. So those first four points there are finding something really interesting, getting some data that will help you demonstrate it, developing a code that actually does the work for you and produces some results that you can add screenshots into your presentation, and then present it. And also, suggest a little exercise that everybody else in here can follow up with over the next week or two from after your presentation. Just so that you can share good ideas and practice them. Because one of the things about SAS is it's so much there that no one person will ever become expert in all of it. And we may not even find a lot of it. And so if someone over there finds something real cool, you guys may be fine. Hey, that's the answer to my prayer. I needed that. I didn't know how to do that. And here's the answer. Now, as I say, we've got 120 manuals from SAS on that CD that we've got, that you've got access to. If you can't find a useful, the right manual there, have a look here, and then you will find vast numbers of other SAS manuals there. But, a caveat, try not to have too much data. A couple hundred lines of data will be quite adequate to show the interesting things. And if you're doing the ETL one, the second week's one, data cleansing, then given you're probably going to have to have a couple of little data sets that connect together somehow, then you really don't want to have too much data, otherwise it becomes difficult to, to demonstrate what you're doing. But like all presentations, you really got to work out very early on what it is your aim is. What is the topic? What is that narrow bit that's going to become interesting? Context. How does your topic fit into that? Because although SAS kind of fits into it in any case, there are going to be interesting areas that you want to really make it very clear why this little bit here that you've chosen is really valuable for data analysis. And I guess this is a kind of really quite a useful reminder that the code that you uh, develop is code that is valuable for people who are doing data analysis, like the data analysts who are doing that work. <clears throat> and so we probably want to, will want an example, a screenshot of some of the raw data, some of the sample code, and you'll be able to post the whole code up on the, um, on the bulletin board area. In the presentation, a little, a little snapshot, a little uh, screen grab of the output. But the really important thing, the last slide or two, this thing called critical evaluation. Thinking in terms of what went well about that little mini project and why. And then some of these other things about you know, what, what didn't work well, why didn't it work well, what should we do in the future? What have we learned basically from doing that little project with SAS and data in that particular area? And this one is going to be really important. What would I do next time that would make, it, make me get to the answer more quickly? And, then, and after each of those 10, 15 minute sections, so 10 minutes to present, 5 minutes to answer questions, we'll be looking at these sort of questions. Was it clear what it was all about? Context, 
data sample, were they suitable, were they really new, do they really get to the heart of what you're trying to show? And the screenshots of those outputs, the results, did they really help me to understand what the whole thing was all about and why it was so valuable? We'll also note down the good points in the presentation and one single item of advice to the pair who presented that presentation about something they could do a little bit better next time. That feeds forward to a second presentation a week or two later. So they did end up with a better presentation. Any questions, folks? Does it all seem nice and clear? Okay, so what we'll do now, um, first things first, will be to begin to sort out the groups. Uh, so I'll switch this off in a second. And then we'll kind of get you into groups or build your pairs. And Dennis tells me that you did quite a lot of teamwork pair work last term. And you might want to work with the same pairs as last term, or you might want to work in new pairs this term. That's up to you.